Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to the 2018 Youth Coaching and Teaching Summit. Appreciate everybody being here. My name is Randy Chang. Uh, I'm actually the new chairman of our teaching committee this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Looking for members, looking for members to get on this committee if you're interested. Please let me know. Uh, we're trying to do some things this year, some exciting things. How many folks went to the uh, the fall teaching summit at Jamie Mulligan's place in Virginia Country Club? Please raise your hands. Uh, that was quite a event that we are looking at, if you can believe it, maybe even topping this year uh, in San Diego with Sean Cox uh, down at um, the Grand. So please watch for that. There's going to be uh, some great, great instructors joining us. And again, with the facility itself, it's going to be another uh, phenomenal event. So look out for that. Uh, I want to bring up Nikki Gatch, who started this Youth Summit a few years ago, three or four years ago, to say a few words. So Nikki, come on up, please. So Nikki is our junior PGA regional manager. Close enough. Close enough. I figured I was asking everybody. Anyways, uh, because of her, we started this uh, a, a few years ago, and we hope to continue this every every spring. Thank you, Randy. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's so exciting. I think this is our fourth year of doing the Youth Golf Summit. Um, I have to admit, I stole the idea, as most good ideas are stolen or borrowed from each other. Um, this was started by one of my counterparts um, in the, on the East Coast. They started the East Coast Youth Golf Summit, and it's just been a tremendous um, program and, you know, wanted to start it out here. So we started in 2015, and it's been wonderful. I know a lot of you in the room have volunteered your time to participate as speakers and participate in this program, so I appreciate it. Randy, thank you, and thanks to the teaching committee for supporting this event um, and, and basically making it our spring teaching summit, which is phenomenal. Um, on behalf of PGA Junior League, I want to thank all of you for your support. It's because of you that we're seeing this tremendous growth. Here in our section, we're on track for about a 25% increase in number of captains and probably about a 25 to 30 percent increase in teams. Seeing a lot of you have multiple teams, a lot of you are deciding to have your own in-house league. It's just phenomenal. So I really appreciate all of your support. All of you new captains, uh, welcome to the program, welcome to the party. Uh, we're here to help you in any way that we can, and I know that um, you're gonna get a ton of wonderful information today some, from some, some outstanding golf professionals, but all of you in this room have tremendous talent and tremendous passion for this game, so I appreciate your support. How many of you are involved with uh, and have a team with uh, the Junior League? Raise your hands. It's good. All right, so our goal and, and part of this summit, you'll hear a lot about the Junior League because just personally what I've seen on how it does build your clientele, uh, retain your, your, your students, uh, and accelerate their learning process. So you, you will, it, it's not a whole pitch, so get more captains in here, but it's just part of uh, your teaching program or should be. So those of you that didn't raise your hands, please uh, listen today and hopefully you can get involved. Right. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks, so today's events, we've got a nice array of different uh, topics uh, that involves our, our teaching. Uh, thanks to, again, our staff that are here, Ariana. Ariana, raise your hand back there, putting all this together. Obviously, our, our, our executive director, Tom Addis, which he's in the back. Thank you, Tom, as always. Uh, and for Robin Sheldon in the, in the back for hosting our event. Thank you, Robin. So first we're going to do a how-to panel, and we have been very uh, privileged to be able to get these, uh, these gentlemen in here. Uh, after that, there's a short little break. Uh, our sponsors that you'll see will be out in the, in the lobby area. Please visit them. Uh, please uh, see what they have to say, even if you're not, possibly does, it doesn't interest you, but please let them know your appreciation. Uh, after that, we'll ha we have Edify, 
which is a, a, an app that's going to help your coaching and keep you in touch with your, with your students. Uh, we're going to have Blast Motion also giving a presentation. How many of you use Blast here in the room? Okay. Then a fitness out in the uh, outside, outside of the clubhouse here. We're going to go outside and be able to stretch our legs a little bit for fitness and, and golf with uh, RK Fitness. Uh, lunch and networking sessions, and then our keynote speaker, uh, which is uh, Will Robbins. So uh, we're going to have a lot of, well, I'd like to see a lot of interaction today, uh, especially from that table in the back there. Uh, how many of you folks? in this room are full-time instructors. Teaching is so just about a quarter of you. Um, how many of you focus primarily on your tour or serious players, college, and, and, and better players? Which is your niche? Just one? Two? Please, please, yeah, let's see what I have in the room in here. How many? Well, that's where your main focus is, yeah, or your, or your main niche in, in what you do. Or I teach everybody. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah then it doesn't matter where they are. It's not just, teach just juniors or teach just, you know, guys that are in college. I mean, it's a mixture of all of Okay. Yeah, I was going to get to that to taught everybody, but... Uh, <laughs> If you just, what I want to look for is kind of the niche in the niche markets, what, what I've done in, in, my, in my career, I've focused on uh, a certain niche of the market that's been really good and others do the, do the whole gamut in what I feel anyways t today uh, with the apprentice. How many apprentices do we have here today? That's a, raise your hands high. One, two, three, five. All right, so that's another thing. I have been appointed the apprentice committee chairman as well. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. And this is one of our big issues right here. You know, we have five apprentices here. Now I know with most of you, for you to be here, your apprentices have to be back at the shop. But we need to figure out a way to have them get involved with things like this uh, because they are our future. They're the future of our teaching. And there's things that, again, that I'll get on my little soapbox in a little later when we get to the panel. Uh, how many folks just focus on juniors? Your main focus, let's just say it. One, two, four. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically all, all juniors, too, or majority of my, of my teaching, and I enjoy that. Okay, good. So the, the reason why I'm asking that is, uh, we all, as, a, as an organization, as a PGA organization, I feel uh, need to get a little bit more on board and together from, from, a, teaching, from a teaching aspect or coaching aspect uh, because as we in the past have lost a lot of our jobs in the management side from general managers from the outside coming in and running our golf courses, our PGA reacted and started educating our head professionals or even apprentices going through the program so that we are more suited for these jobs and we're not losing it to outside, outside entities. Uh, the same thing is I'm starting to see being in the teaching world for the most of my career uh, has happened to our teaching industry. It's like there's a lot of young, good, good instructors, good coaches are coming up that feel like the PGA is not necessary. And so uh, that concerns me, and, and it's going to start with, with what we do in this room. And, and that's why I've taken up this uh, uh, with the teaching committee and, and try, to, try to help with this. So with that, I want to start, uh, let's, get this, let's get this started with this panel that we have here. We've been, again, very privileged to be able to have these, these gentlemen join us today, coming out of their busy days, driving, uh, some long distances as well uh, to come share their successes with you so that again we can all become better instructors better coaches and even better facility managers because you end up managing teaching teachers and man managing coaches so this will all help um, i want to start out with uh, our 2017 award winners uh, 
First, our PGA Golf Professional of the Year from Monarch Beach Golf Course, Eric Lohman. Where are you? Please come on up. We also have our 2017 Teacher of the Year, uh, Bob Madsen. Where are you? Did you already leave already? Oh. <laughs> Please come out. This is Bob Madsen from Sequoia. Uh, no, it's not okay. Please uh, come up to one of these chairs. We have our 2017 Youth Development Award winner, Joe Groman. And we have our Player Development Award winner from the Legends Golf Course, Steve Adamiak. We had one more. We had our Player of the Year. Kenny Pigman was going to join us as well, uh, but he is unfortunately sick and and says, uh, "Sorry, he can't make it." I was going to try to. What holes he on? No, I was trying to give him. I was going to give him a call actually, and and have, I was going to probably give him a call as we go through this. Uh, Conference call. <laughs> I've had the privilege and honor to be able to work with each one of these gentlemen here in one way or the other. And um, I will tell you that they're recognized for what they do and it's all, you know, well deserved. So please, number one, please give them a hand for the work that they do. And for them willingly with just my asking them to come here today um, to share share their knowledge and share why I feel that they are as successful as, as, they, as they have been over all these years. You know, they don't, they took their time out of their day, they're not getting paid. Well, Ken, <laughs> Kenny did ask if I could pay for his gas, but. So to make this very interactive, because a lot of the, how I feel they have become very because they've learned and there's a lot of years of teaching in this room as I, as I look around it and we learn just as much as from you folks if not more than what probably they would say that 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 they can give to you folks but there's probably a few things you folks can take away with you today that will help you at your facility to help you at your academies so with that I'm gonna ask them just a few questions to get it started and then at the same time, I want to make sure I'm even pick some people out in the crowd to, if you don't even want to ask a question, to think of one up to ask them. Because I want them to be, I want this to be a very interactive uh, session here. So we're going to start with uh, our, our junior, our, our youth development. I don't know why they call that anymore. It's just a junior golf leader of the year. Uh, Joe Groman here. On... What is the most important aspect in putting together a successful junior golf program to get this thing started? Thanks, Mike. Randy. I took some notes. <laughs> Please give it up for Randy Chang for doing all the work he does for us. I couldn't come up with just one aspect, Randy. So several important aspects in a successful junior golf program are care, concern, compassion, infectious enthusiasm, yeah. Consistency, unity, building pride in parental relationships. Let me explain. Care, I care about the kids. I care that they chose my junior program. I care that they're there. They're gonna feel that care. Concern, I'm concerned about their safety, that they learn something, that they behave accordingly. I'm concerned. Compassion. Somebody, you got 30 kids, somebody had a bad day, and it's going to show up on their face. Susie, what's the matter? Well, Johnny kicked me out of the playground. What? Are you okay? Yeah. Does Johnny play golf? No. 
you play golf, right? Yeah. Well, why don't you show me how good a golfer you are? We don't need Johnny, do we? No? All right. And we're off to the races. Infectious enthusiasm. Kids are very keen to the level of enthusiasm we bring to the table. Everybody knows that. If you're having a bad day, you just got out of the shop for eight hours and you don't want to be there, they're going to pick up on that. So you want to put yourself on that stage. Be ready with all you got with your infectious enthusiasm. Like Loman at the Oscars last night. That was pretty infectious. Uh, consistency. Our consistency every week, all year long. We got a registration table set up. They get their name tag. We start with stretching. In that stretching, I sign them to their station. So I got all the kids lined up. U10 are going to the range. U10 are going chipping. U10 are going putting. Grip check before they start. So if we're on the range, I want to see their grip. And when they have the proper grip, we give them the proper grip that they're going to remember for the rest of their lives, by the way. Then once they show me that they have the proper grip, they can go begin hitting at their station. They're going to have one key swing thought to start with. On the range, for starters, is balance with us. If the kid can't swing in balance, he's kind of wasting his time a little bit. A one putt putting contest, then we bring it in. After that, we talk to the parents. We're consistent about that every class, every time, all year long. Consistency is also important. The kids and parents know what to expect. If I'm not there, my assistants can easily follow the outline of the class. There's nothing worse than to go to Hawaii for two weeks and come back and your junior program's in shambles. So we want to be consistent with our class. Yeah, it's cool. Aloha. Unity, we start each class with the group stretching. I have a kid tell the story. We tell the same story. It's the same story we tell down at Pendleton when we go do the Wounded Warriors. So I'll ask, who knows the story? Bobby will go, oh, I want to tell the story. What's the story, Bobby? Well, the guy, he came in the shop, and he was super excited, and he's going to play golf with his dad, and he hadn't played in 10 years, and then he went out, and then he was right back in the shop, and he got hurt, and he wanted his money back. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Bobby. That's basically right. So I let him know, you're going to get injured in golf early in a round of golf are early in a bucket of balls because you didn't do some simple stretches. So we go through the simple stretches and I remind them that they will be thanking me 50 years from now for these simple stretches. The grip check creates a unity. Everyone comes together, awesome grip, don't forget it, awesome, go, go, go. So just a few times you can create unity in an individual junior golf program when it's, the kid's kind of on his own. The one hole putting contest at the end of the class, that's unity and sportsmanship. You're gonna be able to teach 30 kids standing in line more about sportsmanship at that moment during your class than you can anywhere else. So we're gonna go up to, hey, you guys, you wanna be quiet. You don't wanna be, you don't want them yelling and screaming when you're hitting your putt. I go, look, you see how that breaks to the right a little bit? That's what you wanna be looking for. You see that? that that, they hit that too hard, so you don't want to really hit it that hard. You want to pay attention to that stuff. So we're going to teach them unity and sportsmanship at that moment. We bring it in at the end of the class. Everyone comes together. I tell them how proud I am of them. Everyone did a great job. Everybody improved. And then we bring the hands in. A lot of these kids, this is their only athletic endeavor. A lot of kids don't have a team atmosphere where they can bring their hands in. Everybody brings their hands in. Ha, 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 and three, one, two, three, ha, ha, ha. That's a good one, because a lot of kids continue to laugh after that one. Pride, the only way we can truly help our students grow is through building their pride, i.e. self-esteem. The student isn't growing, they're stagnating, and they aren't gonna be having a great time, they aren't gonna come back. So lots of approving comments, lots of great shots. Even if they miss the ball, that's the swing you want right there. Let's see if we can hit it, the ball with it now. Great swing. Parental relationships, a lot of us miss this one. The mom is usually the one who's going to be deciding what to do with their leisure time and their money. The mom's going to be the big decision maker on bringing these kids back. 
So make sure the parents during this class get a piece of your attention at some point, especially at the end of the class. Where we miss a lot of this is we don't develop these relationships. We're tired. We've been, a, we've been there for 12 hours. We're ready to run home. Make sure you give those parents a second. Let them know how great their kid did. Remember, the kid's wearing its name tag. So you're Bobby's dad. Bobby did great today. Look forward to having him back next week. In fact, you might say that Bobby is daddy's retirement plan in action. <laughs> Thank you, Loman. <laughs> Care, concern, compassion, enthusiasm. Be consistent, create unity and pride, and befriend the parents, and you will have a successful junior golf program. Thank you, Joe. I was, I was going to ask you another question, but there's other people on the panel, so I'm going to wait till the end, make sure we get enough time. Uh, I feel like the, the, the Oscars last night, there should be a music. Wrap yeah, it up. Yeah, wrap it up. Wrap it up. No. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. You know I can uh, joke with you. So Eric, actually, I, I was going to ask Joe this, but both of you folks do this uh, a lot. It's kind of a follow-up. How has the social media, the way you folks use your social media, affected um, your business, teaching, good or bad? Uh, Eric. Uh, well, thank you again for this opportunity to speak this morning to everybody. Um, you know, social media, as we all know, is, is pretty prevalent in all our daily lives, you know, our personal lives, now very much so in our professional lives. And, uh, you know, at, at Monarch, where I work, um, you know, we were fairly active with social media, you know, the last couple of years, but I probably wasn't as active with it. Um, I was kind of busy these last few years. And, <clears throat> you know, we have a new group of people that work for OB Sports, the parent company. And one of the gentlemen is a professional videographer. He used to work at a TV station. And he came up with this series called the Monday Mulligan. And they proposed uh, to come out to Monarch. And I'm like, ah, what are we going to do? Like, shoot these videos. And... What are they going to be and you know how many are we going to shoot and you know obviously it takes a while to shoot these if you do them right and um i finally got committed to it and uh, we scheduled it and it's been uh, fairly successful for us at least at monarch beach and i've enjoyed it now that i've seen the the end product and i feel like it's portrayed us uh, within our brand correctly and it's portrayed me professionally and um it's kind of a neat thing and then just to expand a little bit so once we started doing these monday mulligans and we started to get some followers and obviously well, we're, the way we're looking at it is, is we, we want to get more lessons, we want to gain more market share, and we want people to know that we're the experts in the industry for that in our marketplace. And to do that, unfortunately or fortunately, we have to be out uh, forward in front of the customers. Uh, we don't have a driving range uh, like a previous club I worked at or previous clubs I worked at, and we don't have a lot of people who are walking up saying, hey, can I take a lesson, except for a few members and a few resort guests. So we actually had to kind of reinvent the way we market ourselves. So we started doing the Monday Mulligans, which, you know, we've, we're probably getting three or 4,000 people now see those. Uh, How many in the group week. have seen that in, in, in here? Uh, my, you all should download the, like, you know, <laughs> like me or follow us because it's really entertaining stuff. Is that folks. with Facebook or Instagram or all the? It's, uh, it's on Facebook, I'm sorry, it's on YouTube. Oh, and then we post it on Facebook, and then now we're going to start pushing it on uh, Instagram and um, LinkedIn. So we're going to hit all the social profiles that you can hit. Um, but one of the things I was going to say is, so we started doing that. I'm like, well, they turn out okay. And people, you know, are, are responding to it. We're booking lessons. They're commenting um, when they come in the shop. Hey, I saw that. I really enjoy that. I use that. I mean, I've actually had people tell me they've gotten better. And now I'm thinking, shit, I'm, I better get better at this, right? <laughs> Their people are paying attention. And then... Um, I, s I also wanted to start doing some blogging and, um, you know, just again to further that social exposure and to gain more friends and likes and that type of thing. And then instead of me actually writing stuff, which I can do and I've done, we started a video blog series where I just answer questions that are presented to me. And um, that's sort of an extension of the instruction. It's more so we can teach and we're experts in the game. And um, the more that we can present ourselves in that manner, I think the more, you know, hopefully the business that we'll get and we'll attract. And we've had a really nice response, and I think some of the, the better stuff is yet to come, and we'll get, continue to push that. How many in the room here are really uh, big or, or very involved with so social media with your, your facilities or schools? Just 
two or three, four. So I think that's where we're at. I was going to get with, with you, Bob, because um, you're another one that I've been following. Um, for the ones that, people in this group here, does anybody follow Bob Matson? Is he eight, four, five? Yeah. See who's the most popular? How about Joe Groman? Joe Groman is always. Right, so he makes the best videos by far. <laughs> so Bob, I know I, I've been following you, and you've been you went with one of our. What was, what was that? Our te the marketing, uh, the teaching marketing, the one on ones that the PGA. Yeah, Chris Loft. Exactly. Can you describe with us? Uh, for us in, in the room here, how that helped you and how that changed in that last year, because I know you're one of the ones that took advantage of that, with the, how, how it relates to social, mar uh, social media and marketing. That wasn't one of the questions you said you were going to ask. I told you, I was, I, <laughs> I'm going to pop a couple up on you. I, go, I, I run it from the seat of my pants right now. Okay. Just answer the question, Bob. Sort of. <laughs> really? Oh, sorry. So. Pushing this boulder, right? So the team at Saquon, Singing Hills, trying to get golf instruction to explode and, and have this be the place in Southern California that everyone wants to come to for golf instruction. I call it pushing the boulder up this hill and decide to hey, I'm gonna brand instead of waiting for my employer or for the corporation <laughs> or for the resort to, to help me push this boulder. So MadsonGolf.com and Facebook and Instagram and sort of confident as an author, as a article writer and as a blogger a little bit. So trying to get that ball rolling. And it's, it's not really about me. It's not really about Saquon partly, but it's more about getting good information out to the golfing public, you know, yeah. helping people and helping people with their lives. That's kind of where I'm going. How, how was that workshop for you? What that one-on-one -on -one workshop? Well, it wasn't a workshop. I, I mean, took on Chris for six yeah, hours, was which it? I think was, where's Brianne? Was free? The first yes. six hours of his services were free. Where's Brianne? Oh, she's yeah. uh, and then I hired him for six more hours, and now I pay him monthly for his service to help manage my website mm -hmm. and publish my newsletter and a little bit of Instagram and Facebook help. Has, has anyone taken advantage of, of those one-on-one -on -one shots here? Anybody else taking advantage of those? It's sort of money that I don't really have to spend, but the relationship with Chris is really cool, and he's super helpful, and um, I recommend reaching out to him. Tom, uh, we've had, what's, what's the ones that we're doing now? Is that for the general managers, or is that done already? Yeah, we need to take advantage of these things, you know, when we talk about what does a PGR section do for us. They're, they're offering this type of education and information, even something like we're doing right here. They get some insight for people that are successful already. We need to take advantage of that. Yeah, the one thing I was going to add is that, I mean, you know, like in my case, we've had a lot of professional help to guide us to make the videos professional, make them look and sound professional. Um, and we have three or four consultants that help us. Yeah. So it's not like we're just sitting around one day saying, hey, let's, let's do this on our own. We're actually asking for help and learning from these folks. And hopefully the, the, the byproduct uh, demonstrates that professionalism. Right. So also- Andy, let me ask something. Yes, question. How many of you guys at least take a video of your student swing and then email it to them right there and then? Yeah, right, yeah, me too. The thing with social media, yeah, it works wonders. We blew up our junior program a few years back, but it's just time consuming, right? You, the consistency is the name of the game with social media. You gotta be consistent about it. Or you're just gonna fade into the woodwork. We've seen it all the time with guys out there doing their little golf shows and they disappear. Unlike, not Loman, Loman's on fire right now. But, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, the very least. Plus, you never know. I mean, it would be nice to have your social media site and post your student swings and all that stuff if they would want it. I probably assume that a lot don't. And they would prefer to do what a lot of us do is that we, 
videotape their swing and just uh, email it right on the spot to them. But, but you just said it, it helped blow up your junior golf program? Absolutely. Okay, so the time is worth it then, because it, otherwise in the past we have to take ads out, you gotta pay for all this stuff. And this is things yeah. you can do. Yeah, it's gonna take some time, but it doesn't have to be money out of your pocket. But yeah, I mean, the tools are here. We do have the resources to do it. I highly recommend it. It's definitely a very easy medium to, uh, to get going and yeah. do something like that. Karen. Lock, Chris Lock. How, how do you spell it? Chris Lock. Yeah. Let me see. Just ask for the verbal disclaimer. It's going great. No. Working so far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah. It's working great so far. <laughs> so far, so good. You, usually when we, when we work with a junior blind, there'll be a few of those kids that can't be videotaped, but by and large, most of the kids in your program, the parents won't have a problem with it. But you definitely want to get, ask them, hey, do you mind Send if I post your kid? This kid's got such a good swing, I want him on yeah. my site. I think there's two things. There's obviously taking a video of your student and sending it to them and their family. That's one thing. And there's taking a video and, sh and sending it to the 17,000 people who follow you on Facebook. Or that's a different thing. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Very good. All right, thank you. Uh, well, I want to move to, to Steve over there with a question. Um, Steve, which is our player development leader and award winner, how has the PGA Junior League helped with player development, building a client book and retaining them as golfers? Well, Junior League's been fantastic. I mean, especially with new players. Uh, I think for a lot of us, you know, we realize some of the, the tough things like that's involved with getting golfers not only in but to stay with it. You know, I, I talk to parents all the time when it comes to kids. You know, we know the time uh, restraints, you know, when you've got to be out there for a significant amount of time at the course. Uh, huge thing in Southern California that I've seen, I know, and I think these guys can back up too growing up is there's so many things now that are competition to golf. Uh, it's not just different programs in the area, but all the different sports, everything that's offered out there. I mean, I talk to parents all the time, and you know, they're talking about trying to one day, you know, their kids uh, doing dance, and the next day they're at karate, next day they're playing baseball, next, you know, so it just goes on and on. And, you know, where can golf fall into that? Now, I mean, we all, I'm sure, have used a little bit to some degree the idea of trying to express to those parents, you know, that the kids are going to attain, you know, incredible values through golf. We know that golf's one of those few sports, calling a penalty on yourself, that, you know, you definitely get tremendous character uh, through golf, you know, by having more integrity uh, having certain characteristics that are going to hopefully take, you know, make golf so intriguing to have, you know, kids get into it and make their, and have their parents want to get them involved in it because, I mean, a lot of times when you see kids that are, that are involved in golf, how many of us out there truly have seen kids that are like big troublemakers uh, that, that are golfers? I would like, I mean, maybe maybe a couple, but for the most part, I'd like to think that most of us, when we see kids that are uh, having golf be a big influence in their life, you know, you can see it on a regular basis, uh, how, how it leads in other ways. So a uh, big thing for us as far as like with Junior League, I mean, I see, I see a tremendous uh, 
thing going strongly when it comes to getting new golfers out, you know, involved. I mean, it's uh, it's been great. Like at our facility, I mean, I've got three teams uh, at our facility, and a huge thing about having uh, those teams is that when it comes to retaining, you know, we're we're always looking for ways in ourselves of how to help retain golfers. But honestly, what I've seen is that. If you just get the kids out there, there's nothing better to retain them than to get them to build some friendships. Uh, the social aspect is huge for kids. And if you can create an environment at your facility that makes the kids want to come out there and makes the parents feel that they've had, that it's an extremely safe environment uh, for their kids to be in nowadays, because I, I mean, I get plenty of parents that are still worried about leaving their child alone, you know, that's even 9, 10, 11 years old at the club. So if you can really do a good job of creating a really safe environment uh, at your facility and then just, you know, creating ways to make it to where the kids are really social. I know, like, for instance, one thing I do uh, when we get junior leagues started, uh, I'll I'll kind of create a little questionnaire and I tell each kid one thing that I, you know, that's something different about them, uh, you know, that, you know, that they can tell me that, you know, you know, just be something unique. And then what I do is I play a little game at the beginning where I put all those questions that I asked uh, on basically one piece of paper, make copies, give them to all the kids, and then they have to go around to each kid uh, and at and find out who's you know basically whose question whose answer that belongs to to get them to kind of get to know each other a little bit better uh, get to you know hang out just start to build some relationships that way uh, and then just other things then once the three teams are kind of broken up you know then just really creating some uh, ways you know whether it's you know they they all take pride in like creating their own team name uh, for instance uh, you know, just just doing lots of games and activities to really get the kids uh, to really get comfortable with each other. And, you know, then from that, with the Junior League, that's where we see it year-round then. Uh, because the, the kids are out there then year-round. I mean, some that have met each other through Junior League that are playing with each other now the rest of the year, they got that friend. But if you're not doing a good job of getting the kids uh, in, in a setting to where they're comfortable with the other kids and really creating some friendships, that's a huge thing where I see you're gonna lose them. I mean, if you can really get some good friendships, get the social aspects going, uh, to me, the rest will take care of itself. Thank you, yes, it's been a, a great experience and great for my program, personally myself, I know I'm not on the panel, but I'm gonna yeah, speak for, <laughs> I'm gonna speak from experience on, on why the Junior League has been um, instrumental in instrumental in uh, growing our academy. We also have three teams, no, four teams. We're going to have five teams within the facilities that uh, that I have, and it's growing and growing. So we've been able to kind of parlay that into to get on the team now. Since it's so popular, you have to go through our program. So our program has gotten. Uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, the retaining of it again has to do with now we're in a year-round program instead of just during during the summer. Uh, with that, you know our facilities, and that's the next question I'm going to uh, give to Eric here uh, and Joe Groman as far as at your facilities. How is that? What that meant from say. Uh, has it been a positive experience, incremental income-wise, um, social-wise? Please give us your, for the Junior League, because uh, just so you know, uh, I, we've started, uh, Monarch Beach just started their, their first Junior League team, and uh, with, with my help. Yeah, no, it's the yeah. Randy Chan <laughs> Junior League <laughs> at our place. But, but I, uh, I just know that it, was, it would be good. It fills up some dead space, but uh, Eric, tell us your experience as, from a facility standpoint, why the Junior League has been um, really good. Like, a, yeah, I mean, again, Monarch has always been challenged because we don't have a driving range or traditional driving range. So, you know, and we're also fairly busy and we're at somewhat high end that it's hard for us to facilitate a lot of junior programming, but we wanted to have some junior programming. And with, with Randy's help, we brought in um, his group last year and we did junior league. And uh, we saw some success from it, obviously. And then this year, 
we've embraced it. And then internally, we have our own team now, and we're going to go to our second team here in the next season. And, um, you know, for us, it's great because you – we're getting some new kids that haven't uh, traditionally come out to Monarch Beach. We're getting their parents. If these kids live in our community, they're probably fairly well off to begin with. And what we're witnessing is that the parents, um, you know, like to rent carts and – you know, they like to drink a couple adult beverages while they watch Johnny and Susie play, which yeah. I don't blame them. <laughs> and um, so, you know, we're getting that. And then now on the back end of it, we're probably going to start to sell some clubs and things of that nature. So, you know, Brandon Delgado, who's our director of golf, who's not here today, um, has kind of championed uh, the cause with your help. And then Seth Glasgow, who's uh, an instructor that helps us out. Uh, the two of them are, are the ones that are the most engaged in that process. And, you know, again, it's incremental for us. It's completely incremental revenue, which if you know how the way we run our businesses, it's exactly how we drive revenue, obviously. And for us to now have a new revenue stream, and, and also, you know, there's, you know, selfishly, it's great to see kids enjoying the game of golf at our facility that used to never really see that. So um, it's just gonna help us, you know, tenfold with the community relations, the, some of the things that we do care about as a brand um, and some of the initiatives at our resort, which just went through a $55 million renovation, one of our initiatives is community involvement. So we instantly are making money, growing the game, and embracing the community with one effort. I mean, that's a home run. Yeah, that's great. Joe, at that Navy, when you're there managing <laughs> that place, <laughs> How did, how, how did it do from, from that? I know just from the, from the good hardness of you, you running that, but um, did, did that help from a facility revenue Absolutely. Uh, who's got a junior league golf program? We've got. So you guys know how cool this program is. It's, uh, it gives the kids something to shoot for out of our junior program. To make the team, you can only really field eight to ten kids. So it's not a, if you don't do them, they're not a huge team. But to make the team is quite an honor. So it's actually driven, uh, since we've had such success with our team, made it pretty far until till the guy in San Diego got a hold of us. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, we, the parents are bringing more kids who are more sports team oriented. We're seeing that, you know, we're seeing uh, their goal to make this team happen. So they're sticking around, they're working harder, they want to be on the team. Because it's, it's, you know, they, they see the kids running around with their team shirts on they want to be a part of that so it's kind of and how does it affect the facility from the facility's eyes uh, you know seeing all these kids run around but not only that uh, the, the time that it takes on the golf course does it affect that time that you're putting them on the course well not really because we're playing late in the summer we're playing at four it's usually quiet time we're lucky we got 27 holes we could throw them on the nine hole anytime if we have to so in that respect it's really not it's usually a later in the day type thing going on uh, Twilight usually runs out, runs its course by three, so it's not really impacting that at all. Uh, we do, uh, part of the revenue does go to the course, so they're happy about that. Like Eric's saying, we do charge for the spectator carts. We do have our little cart girl driving around making sure that, that they have access to beverages and water and all that during these matches, because yeah. usually everybody brings their parent, they're out there watching their kids, so you usually got a nice little full field there. I know. Uh, Steve wants to add something to that, too. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Yeah, um, I mean, the big thing with, like, at our facility, the way it impacts is, you know, we hope the ownership sees that, like, we do a lot of our matches, like, on a Friday evening, uh, you know, during the summertime, you know, at, at 5 o'clock, you know. So, I mean, it's going to be a time that's going to be a very a dead time anyway. So... Because from the, the problem we fight always is that, well, if the ownership sees it as like, well, you're, you're giving all the, you know, doing a bunch of discounting in order to get the golfers out, you know, that can create definitely a, a little bit of a problem if you're putting the, the kids out at more prime time, you know, uh, time. So we definitely try to do it at a time that's very, you know, convenient, you know, that we like to think in the owner's eyes uh, at the golf course. Uh, trying to, you know, make them see that, okay, we're giving, like, discounted fees, and, you know, that's something that, you know, hopefully on top of it, though, like to Eric's point, they see it, well, hey, now mom and dad are coming out, and now they're buying a cart, you know, to go watch their kid, you know, then they're staying around and hopefully, you know, purchasing some stuff from food and beverage. 
So that's what we're definitely trying to make the ownership see that, yes, I mean, all of us are in this room, of course, to grow golf, you know, help retain golfers. Uh, but we do, at the same point, you know, trying to show the ownership of, you know, I know like at our facility, uh, you know, that we, we do have your best interests in mind too and definitely trying to, you know, create a little bit of extra revenue in those downtimes. Okay, thank you. So my point on, on this is on these questions from the facility standpoint, uh, from the actual uh, league standpoint, from, from the juniors, they all benefit. And, and also I want to make clear or make you folks think about is like from the coaching, coaching standpoint, this is not a freebie to give your time away. You know, the, the people, when you put this team together of 12, of 12 kids, I know we're charging anywhere from 200 to, I know we're charging about three, 300 for, you know, approximately two to three months uh, where, where, you're, where the child has, has a place to play in different places, I might add. Um, there is room for a pretty good little chunk of money to pay yourself or your coaches, as I do. So uh, the thing is, it's a win-win for everybody. The kids also seem to accelerate in their learning because they seem to be more focused because it's not just them anymore. They get tired of playing their, their, their normal rounds with their, on their own golf course with the people that they see every, you know, every weekend. So that's what I've, that I have discovered and I've seen has turned this into a, a, a very, again, lucrative, a uh, little program here, even though it's a uh, feel good, it's uh, good for the facility, it, it's a win-win for everyone. So the ones that have, didn't raise their hands, they look into that, all right? And, and that's uh, uh, part of this, um, this panel discussion. Uh, Bob, let's get back to you on, on the teaching side of it, you know, what we're here. Uh, in, in your place where you're at, uh, what do you feel your strengths as a coach and a teacher, and what did you have a niche in the, in the market um, at your academy? Well, thank you very much, and Nikki's now looking at me. <laughs> you know what I have a junior golf league. My boss is peering over my shoulder because we do not have a junior golf league. So now I'm all blushed. <laughs> I didn't want to. Um, there was a plan on that. Yeah, thanks very much. Teacher of the year. Uh, <laughs> probably. Brianne says you have to speak in the first week of January. Hi, Brianne. So, besides you not doing the junior league, strengths as far <laughs> as. What, what are your other strengths? Recognizing that we're not really coaching golf, we're coaching human beings. And the reason that I had this piece of paper in front of me because I lost track of the number of human qualities that Mr. Groman mentioned. Please help me. Sportsmanship, humility, kindness. These are the kinds of things that I think we should be conveying. I'm not so worried about the person's top of their backswing and the right elbow close and sit on a seat and turn in a barrel. We certainly don't want to do the keep your head down thing, and I think there's more to be said on that later. So recognizing that when you spend an hour with someone, you're not really coaching golf, you're coaching a human being. And they have concerns and considerations. And how many of you have no concerns whatsoever? <laughs> Does anyone in the room have no concerns whatsoever? And so the person shows up for their golf lesson and youth, I think, could be defined because I'm a little older. Yes, you are. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> You know, maybe youth is 30, maybe youth is 25, maybe youth is 20, maybe youth is 17 or 16 or 15 or 14, 13. But these people have concerns, and then we lop more concerns on them when we ask them to do certain things with their body or with their club. Probably my biggest specialty is removing concerns. You might have seen on Teacher's Huddle a couple of weeks ago, I had a gentleman show up with 21 swing thoughts. Used to be able to shoot in the low 80s. Golf instruction kind of ruined him. Indoor golf instruction in particular, sorry. If you're doing indoor golf instruction, kind of ruined him. He had 21 swing thoughts, couldn't break 90 and wanted to quit. 
So I sort of specialize in removing them. Are you thinking when you're swinging? I hope the answer is no. Keep going. Is that it? <laughs> no, you go. You're, you're on a roll. I, I like yeah. You have any more? I, I can keep going. <laughs> a little bit more. I got about a minute left. A little bit more. Yeah. So are you thinking when you're swinging? I kind of hope the answer is no. I want it to be like a bike ride on the beach. Right? It's just riding your bike on the beach and enjoying the scenery, enjoying the fresh air, and enjoying the companionship. You're not worried about, oh my God, bike instruction in my head. Right? I think we need to do better at that, removing golf instruction rather than adding to the gobbledygook. That's my mom's term. She used that in 1973. We were taking lessons together, and she said, don't give me any of your gobbledygook. So uh, my recommendation, whether it's kids or otherwise, don't dole out gobbledygook. There's just too much of it out there. I'd say remove, remove the gobbledygook, help people free up, and able to think less and concentrate a little maybe more on course management and short game and creativity and shot making, not just juniors, but everybody. Do you recommend, I guess? I like recommend it. giving golf lessons, not golf swing lessons. Carry on? No, that's enough. Off. That's enough. Okay. <laughs> with that, though, with, with, with getting into that, um, one, of, one of my objectives, I, I I want to try to start, and especially getting in a room with, with a lot of teachers. Uh, there's no one way to teach a golf swing. I think we all agree upon that. Is anybody doesn't agree upon that? There's more than one way to teach a golf swing, or no? Steve Sowell will argue it. Th there is one way, just. Well, my way is the best. My way. Well, no, my way is the best. This is what I mean. <laughs> um, but there's got to be a few things we can all hopefully agree upon when it comes up, uh, to some of these topics here, whether it's probably not from the golf swing mechanic standpoint, but there are, there are a few things that uh, maybe in, in this room that we would all agree upon. I was going to ask the panel right now from, from the standpoint of, like for instance, the whole head down thing. You, you don't you don't have, how many people in the room think this is to hit a golf ball, to play the game of golf recreationally, that it takes good hand-eye coordination? What? Yeah, what? It takes hand-eye coordination to hit a golf ball. Yeah. To enjoy the game of golf from a recreational standpoint, you need hand-eye coordination. What's the hands up again? Okay, how many think, no, you don't need hand-eye coordination to hit a golf ball? Well, that's what I'm, so that's my point. Hand-eye coordination, I mean, you have to have hand-eye coordination to hit a golf ball. <clears throat> I, I say no, but there's a lot of people that still, that uh, in this room, with the majority of them raise their hands, think it's yes. All right, so that's something. What does this panel say? Well, I mean, my students are really bad. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I don't think they have much coordination at all. So I try to teach them how to find their coordination. Um, but, you know, I don't, Again, I, I don't know if you're, th there really is no set way to teach. There's no set philosophy. If anybody here has ever worked with any of the great teachers, most of them have probably shared that with them, except for a few who probably just were so dead set on their own way that um, they, they, they try to teach that one philosophy. But, um, you know, if, if you're a good teacher, I think you have to learn from your student, learn what motivates them, what engages them, and then figure out a way to get them to at least enjoy the lesson so they can come back and return and speak positively of the lesson, but if you're teaching, uh, you know, a dead set philosophy, you're probably going to run into a, a dead wall, or you know, you're going to run out of students. So, well, we have a, an example of that. Is like what you said. It teaches one philosophy, one swing. Uh, does everybody know GG Golf or George George Genkis? Sort of. Yep, sort of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, he's uh, you know one philosophy. He's real real popular. I would imagine, right? Everybody that. Extremely popular, you know, not a PGA golf professional, but ex extremely popular. And I can name, you know, uh, a number of them, like Seth Glasgow, good, good instructor, right? I mean, don't get confused though. I think you, as a teacher, you could always have philosophies that you you are 
you think are the better ones. Yes. You know, and then if you if you look at a student and there's you know, there's three or four ways to skin a cat, and one of them might be the one you prefer to teach, but that student might not get any better with that philosophy. You better know how to pivot quickly to another philosophy or another, another way to do it, or that student will go come start watching my videos. <laughs> and then Excellent. They're, hooked. they're hooked at that point. Bob, on, on that question, the hand-eye coordination thing, what, do you feel you need hand-eye coordination to hit a golf ball? Hand-eye coordination, absolutely not. Yeah. I believe centrifugal force and trust delivers the club to the back of the ball more reliably than we can with our hand-eye coordination. So I'm trying to talk really fast in case I ever get on the golf yeah. channel, right? <laughs> uh, where if it was tennis or baseball, what have you, now you need to find the ball because it's moving. I consider golf to be a little bit more like kicking field goals, right? The ball's sitting still. You don't need to rely on hand-eye coordination to deliver the club to the back of the ball. I don't tell anyone this really ever. Like you have to pin me up against a wall with a shirt and tie in a room with PGA professionals to get me to talk about this stuff. Yeah. But it delivers trust and centrifugal force delivers the club to the back of the so ball the more reliably. No. Right. So the answer is no. no. Sorry. How about you? Well, you know, we teach junior blind and disabled veterans have taught a vet that didn't even have hands. Um, I think it's your level of success you're looking at and what you're trying to do with the student. I mean, there's no reason that every single golfer can't enjoy the lesson, can't, it, can't have a level of success with wherever you set the bar. Yeah. If it's just this high, set it that high so they can enjoy it. Steve. Yeah, definitely don't. I mean, I remember a golf course I grew up working at. I mean, we held an amputee golf tournament there every year, and I was just absolutely blown away. I mean, all the yeah. time what I saw and, and witnessed from, uh, from those guys out there. So... I mean, you know, my big thing too, I mean, when I go out there, I mean, a lot of time, whether it's a clinic, you know, I'll joke around and, you know, tell people, you know, to me, I always say, you know, by definition, you know, a fundamental is something that every great ball striker has done in the history of the game, okay? But yet everybody is always, you know, talking about, ah, oh, you got to keep your head down, you got to keep your arm straight. So, you know, I mean, I go out of my way to, you know, do the opposite of that, to strike a ball well where I'll pick my head up and not even look at the ball, turn and hit it up, you know, and there and obviously get a laugh from the crowd. But it's just trying to get people to understand truly what are the fundamentals versus the typical myths that are being preached all the time. And then just the other one big aspect I want to talk about is just, you know, in, in going back to the social media, I mean, we, we all use it for, like, advantage, you know, I mean, for, for different reasons, but it's obviously part of the problem, though, is that it, it's, there's too much easy access nowadays, I mean, for people. And, I mean, a huge problem that we have out there is we can't get our students to really, even for, <laughs> let alone one week, one day, really focus and give what we're trying to give them a chance to succeed. So that is always a huge challenge that, you know, you've got to be extremely careful how much you say to the student in the big picture with what they're going to retain and trying to get them to stay on track because the reality that they might be on YouTube later uh, checking things out after what you gave them or they have somebody in their family or a friend giving them advice, the reality is that's probably going to happen. And you just got to try to get that across to your student okay, you came to me for a reason, investing your time and your money, you know, it's so are you going to give me a chance, the guy that, you know, is, likes to think he's, you know, an expert in this field, you know, like I tell people all the time, I'm wrong about, uh, I'm wrong about a lot of things, but it's not golf. It's like I tell my students. <laughs> so it's like, if you give me a chance, you know, to, to do it, it's, you know, you, you're going to see that you're going to have success from it, but you know, if you're going to be going around from idea to idea, you know, literally a day or two later and seeing, like, what the latest and greatest is on YouTube, you know, your chances of, you know, succeeding, obviously, are going to diminish greatly. So, you know, that's, those are the challenges I think all of us fight with, so, you know, as teachers nowadays, too. As great as social media is in a lot of ways, also can be definitely detrimental to, our, uh, to ourselves, too, with our students. Thanks, Steve. Now, the reason why I asked that question already, we, we had the hands raised about you know, just the simple thing of hand-eye coordination. We're all 
not real sure or you are sure, um, but in, in our day today where we're trying to develop players, we're, we're trying to retain, we're trying to develop them. The biggest things for instruction and coaching is well, it's too hard to learn, it takes too long, it takes too much time, uh, too expensive. Right? Those are the three main issues and why. As, as coaches, teachers, instructors in this room, if we're telling people that you have to have good hand-eye coordination to just play the game, not saying good, but just to play and enjoy the game, uh, we're deterring from these people coming into our industry because they never played a, a hand-eye coordinated sport, so they don't feel they can play golf. But if we still decide that, okay, you do need to, and I'd say absolutely not either, where you don't need hand-eye coordination, you can just as you can say, figure out a way to get that club back to the golf ball. The more coordinated you are, the easier it is, no question about it. But you can, you can work with a student. But first, if we're already from the get-go saying, hey, if you don't have hand-eye coordination, it's going to be hard for you to play the game, we're already giving them a kind of a negative attitude about, about trying it. So this is just one of, one, one of my points to where I'd like to see if we could get on board with a handful of things that we can all agree upon as an organization because that's why we're seeing all these other all these other entities come in and and taking over a lot of our industry and a lot of our students okay because they do believe in a philosophy or or something very deeply i'd like us as an organization organization to start getting together and having some basic what you would call fundamentals what are those i'm not really sure but like from a teaching standpoint on just giving a lesson Bob, what's, what's one thing you have to do? Something you have to do. So we've talked about this a little bit in these seminars and over these many years, and there's differing opinions and conflicting opinions and what have you. And sometimes the less experienced golf instructors leave the room maybe more confused. And so we talked a little bit about, hey, can we have some non-negotiables? And one of them would maybe be punctuality. How many of you guys would agree that punctuality would be professional? Or let's just put it the other way. Who doesn't, who, who feels like it's not a big deal if you're a little late? Anybody? Okay, so, so there you are agree. in the doctor's so office <laughs> and you got there five minutes early and the doctor doesn't call you in for 10 or 20 minutes. That's a bummer. And I'm not sure where the list goes from there, but I would like for this, our committee, and maybe the people in this room to start to try to find some common ground. Kindness. Eric, what about you? It has to do in three, uh, I mean, not three, but uh, different areas when it comes to teaching the golf swing, playing the game, giving a lesson, equipment, uh, even something uh, from a mental standpoint. What are things that we can agree upon as a, as a group that you have to do? Well, you, you have to be engaged. I mean, you have to absolutely yes. be engaged with your student. Your student has to know that your time with them, that you care, that's like the most important thing on earth. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I have a hard time putting my phone down. So, um, yeah, you get that. No, no, don't touch my phone. That's, that's but, uh, you know, one of, my, one of our teachers the other day, you know, I think it was Seth, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago, was watching me teach somebody, and I walked by him, and he looked at me, and went, he went engaged, and he went like this. And I'm like, you know, what I wanted to tell him is I had, like, 40 things wrong that day that I needed to fix, and this one lesson was going okay, so I just had to get the hell on out of there. And, uh, but when I walked away, I felt really bad about it, you know, because this person had just paid me, and... You know, and this person I cared about, and uh, you know, from, so it just kind of reminded me that, you know, I needed to be more engaged when I was with my own students. And since then, I think I've done a little bit better job with it. But engagement, I think, is huge, especially if you care about retention. You guys would agree. No, who doesn't agree? That's who doesn't agree. We need a who doesn't agree. Hey, there we go. We got another one to the list. Joe Groman. Kind of along you, those lines, care, concern, and compassion. Yeah, so these are on giving, giving a lesson, which is all obviously good in giving a lesson. Uh, is there anything as far as teaching the golf swing? Balance. It, balance. Uh, well, that's my... But I think you, if I'm engaged with my student, I'm also going to talk to my student. I'm going to learn from my student. You know, what are their, what do they care about? What are they trying, what are their goals for the lesson? 
And then so I got an interview. The interview. Totally. There has to be a really good quality interview, and, and everybody has their own technique. Some people. Does can, anybody agree? I mean, disagree in this room that you should give an interview for your first student? Email or otherwise. Doesn't matter. Anybody? See, we got we're, we're, we're going good. But then, cool. and then on that, when you're learning, you're going to learn kind of what they want from that lesson because hopefully you do that because that's yeah. what they're paying you for. Yeah. But then also you can learn a little bit about their physical makeup, their history. You know, yeah, are they yeah. in, have they been injured? Are they currently injured? Did they play other sports? You know, you talk about you keep talking about hand-eye coordination, but uh, I hope we don't confuse that with just coordination, right? Because there's two different the types of things there. And um, hand-eye coordination. You need yeah. your you need your eyes and your coordination right. to hit a golf ball. But if they're missing a limb or they're blind, they can still be f fairly coordinated. But if our students are not coordinated, they did not play sports growing up or they just weren't successful at it, you can maybe teach a different way, you know, simplify it a little bit. I like that. Steve, any, anything want to take a stab at anything with the golf swing in, in hitting a golf, or how we teach a golf swing? Or He's the teacher of the year. I know. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, when I'm trying to develop players, I mean, just piggybacking on what I was saying, I mean, I always tell them, I mean, consistent swings start with consistent thoughts. So, consistent thought. So this is a. So it's it's just getting them to actually stick to something, uh, for actually a period of time. I mean, all of us in this room have our own idea of how we're going to start a beginner player, or how we're going to, you know, if we get more of an advanced player that comes to us and we go through our interview and you know get a chance to get to know them and what they want, what their goals are, you know, short term, long term, all these things. But like I say, I I see one of the the hugest problems just you know, with students in general, it's just they don't keep any consistency. I mean, as far as like actually following through on a game plan. So it's like, you, you, you know, to me, you've got it, you've got to put it in their court as well. I mean, you're, you're there, like Eric said, you're engaged, you're motivated, you're doing everything you can. And yeah, of course, you're, you're doing it partly because, I mean, it's, it's how you're making a paycheck, but you're also doing it because you care, because you love doing it, and it does give you something right here that makes you feel really good about helping others. But at that same time, I mean, when you're engaging them, I mean, you do have to make them take some responsibility as well, because obviously when things go wrong after you've given them something and the first time they go out on the course and they're struggling, well, who are they blaming? A lot of times, I mean, they're they're blaming us, the instructors. So you know, you do have to make sure that you do have them so, take some responsibility too. So, give me a phrase, give me a a word, just consistent what? Player development, consistent player development. Yeah, I mean, a, a cons I mean, consistency, a consistent game plan, consistent. You know, I mean, fo following through on a game plan. Okay. Giving it a chance. One of the things that we do is we, we talk about realistic expectations. So in that interview process, you know, what allows us to set the game plan is to find out what they need or what they want. And then we try to establish a realistic expectation within that guideline. And then with that, you can build a game plan. So they flow together. Bob, you're, you're like... I know. I'm fired up. Saying, Sorry. Yeah. Single-mindedness. Yeah. I feel like professionals are single-minded. They have the stuff that they need and they stick to it, right? And amateurs are kind of all over the place and scatterbrained. Yeah. So I try to help them Be become single. a little more single-minded. Okay. Um, what else was I gonna say? Anybody, the, anybody out there that wants to throw something out that you would like to see? Sure. No matter what you teach, we could go on and on about hand eye. If I stick your hands in an ice bucket for half an hour, you're not going to hit it as well as the yeah. But when you're talking about hand eye and all that, yeah, you're talking about a level of what if they want to be a 36 handicapper, you could hit the ball all kinds of ways one leg, blind, all that. Exactly. So, but you, I feel you have to have some talent and you have to have work ethic. And those are things that we can't really teach talent. But you Sure. And then they leave happy. 
So, so, so what I'm looking at uh, overall, everything that you said that, that, that I like there, it's like a terminology. It, that, that's kind of my point is like, we, if we take hand-eye coordination out of this, it'll bring more people into the game. Like you say, all this stuff that we talk about in teaching a lesson. The other one, head down thing. Now this is my big deal because of the safety aspect of it. Uh, we have seen too much right now where our juniors are getting hurt because we've allowed them to swing a certain way because grandpa or dad's holding their head, keeping their head down, keeping their head down. I'd love to get on this is where we just take that term, that term out of our teaching vocabulary. Does anybody in this room, like I said, would disagree with that? Or you still say, no, you have to make sure you keep your head down. There we go. So we're taking head down out of our BGA <laughs> terminology. Uh, because like I said, that's what I've seen. And, and too much of happening as far as safety is not the kids hitting themselves over the head with the clubs, but actually hurting themselves by the way we're allowing them to swing. At the same time, equipment. When we used to cut down our dad's clubs or women's clubs, they're too heavy. And again, the safety where, where, where they're hurting their back. So I think they, the kids should be make sure they're, they're swinging the right club. Back in our days, it didn't matter. Just uh, the philosophy was get a cut down club from your mom or dad, swing it as hard as you can, and then we'll fix you later. And that's how I was brought up in the teaching aspect and let's 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 hit it hard hit it really hard in which i agree hit it hard but the way we've allowed them to hit it hard uh, and everyone has seen in this room is what has happened over the last 20 years right? so that's another one of the the things so we all agree i can we can take keep your head down out of our teaching vocabulary there you go so we're already on board here anybody else before we wrap it up over here uh, any other questions for the panel? Anybody else want to? Yes. Just, just real quick, just take the discussion back to more youth or age specific. Yes. Um, that, that's primarily why I'm here and what I, I don't know as much about. Right. But I want to see if our panel can touch on age segmentation. So I know skiing, and from three to six, it's daycare. And from six, it's dependent upon skill set, physical ability, not so much age, but then a little bit of age for a social component. So when you guys go into your programs, can you, can you touch on, on just that? What's the youngest age you'll accept? Is it age or developmental? And then from well, there, how does it shift from just games and having fun and keeping them safe to really getting into the skill set? I mean, at, at our facility, it's, it's finding the instructors that will fill those uh, demographics. So, you know, like Randy has got Tiny Tees, um, which he's really, his company's really good at teaching kids that are ages, three I think three, three or four to seven. To um, and obviously the, you know, back when I started, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, that was very uncommon to see like a three or four year old or a five year old. I mean, I started when I was eight and I think I was one of the younger players. And now, you know, we, you know, when I was running Oak Creek, you know, there'd be a Saturday morning and we'd have like 33 and four year olds out there. And, you know, they have to have the right instructor or instructors um, that could manage that type of clientele. And obviously, when you're at three, four, five, six, if you all have children, and most of us do, you know, there's one in 20 that can pay attention. And there's maybe one in 20 that's actually got some coordination that could pull off what you're telling them. So you have to be able to segment them within their own age group. And then, you know, obviously, in that stage, it's fun, some fundamental, uh, and, and safety, right? And then if you actually do have like a prodigy type student, and somehow you have to be able to separate that student or two to give them a little extra follow-up or a little extra attention um, because the parents are going to demand it and then you owe it to the game to, to help that child out as well and then obviously as you go into the older age groups it's all going to kind of flow similarly um, but you're I think you're talking more so like how do you exactly set it up with age you know gender um, I think common sense plays into all that right so if, you're, if you ever talk to like a kindergarten teacher or a first grade teacher, I mean, you all know teachers, right? So ask a teacher how they set up their class, you know? And there's always different philosophies. And I think how you want to do it or your teacher, or, or in our case, the company that we work with, you know, you just kind of have to do it based on what you're trying to accomplish. But there probably isn't a right way or a wrong way. There's just some really far lefts and far rights that are wrong, but the middle is kind of acceptable. 
Let me let, let me ask because I've got myself set up uh, with with that whole age group. So we have our tiny T's, three to five, six, uh, th three to six years of age. Uh, we have our level ones, and they could be. They, we have some four or five year olds that can be in that level one where they uh, have some of that coordination or uh, the attention span. Uh, level one is developmental, just getting them um, hitting a golf ball, understanding uh, etiquette, that kind of stuff. Uh, by level two, they're going to be getting them golf course ready. Uh, so from golf course ready at level two, and they get uh, they get their hats, they even get their special sock colors, like uh, it's like karate. Uh, we get up to level three, uh, which is our kind of our tournament players, and then we have an elite group we call the Chang Gang, which is the uh, uh, level four. Um, but to your point, how Junior League has played a super big role in this is that now uh, they have to go through at least level our level one to get golf course ready to get into our junior league teams so now that's what has built our our whole academy of getting more people coming on in uh, the person's friend who said oh i want to play on a junior league team well you got to first you got to take our our level one which is a five-week program uh, to get them golf course ready after level two and then they can go ahead and try out for the team so uh, we have, like I said, I have a, a five, six-year-old that's playing um, uh, on a junior league team. I mean, is that the little prodigy guys that you talk about? So you evaluate it from each from each of those parts. So like I said I have uh, schools and programs at five facilities now in Southern California, starting with this tiny tees that, like you say, is, is daycare. Yes, but we are actually getting them, you know, started with golf and. Not only that, the parents, they come with an entourage of grandparents, aunts, uncles that want to see little Johnny or Sally play and just hit a golf ball. And we have a spe specific program that allows that to happen. So from a facility standpoint. And one thing too, so when you have it set up and if, you know what, the thing that I noticed, especially at like Oak Creek was with all these children that they're coming in younger and they're also coming in more prepared. They're also coming in like, you know, back in the day, I think that was just like a, you know, it was, it was like an S storm, right? All these kids running around, they all needed Adderall. And now yeah. these kids run in, now they come in and they're very, dis they're more disciplined than they used to be. And you might have a group of 10 kids and say a couple of them outliners are just not really acting the way they need to and they're affecting the other eight. Well, you just pull them aside and you ask the parents, hmm. you know, this isn't right for them, send them home, you know? And because there's, there's so many more kids that will do it, you can get away with that. And um, you'd be amazed that, uh, how that can affect the group and, and you, you know, you can keep moving forward. Yeah. Yes. Uh, to drill more specifically into his question, let's say you have a five-year-old that is a good golfer, right? Could go out, play golf, bring him home. And you've got Jesus. a 13-year-old that can barely make contact, right? Um, if you put the 13, and you have a big group, you want to separate it by age for the social aspect, but you also want to separate it by skill level so that they're actually getting something out of the Guys. Yeah, I uh, I, I keep I, I, I separate them by age definitely, but when they're when they're on the line, the five year old, you know, like I said, we start with balance, parameters of behavior. You got to establish those right away, Kyle. If they if the parameters of behavior are established, the kids can grow up. If they're not, they're gonna go sideways on that. So, Loman was alluding to that, but I keep them in the, in their ages. That way, that five year old. We're going to be working on something different than the kids that are still working on balance. And he's going to be the little inspiration for all the other five-year-olds. And the 13-year-old, we're going to be working. And like you said, I put him with the five-year-olds. He's not coming back. So we keep him, we break him up in age that way like that. So maybe the 13 year old maybe there's another 13-year-old who's got his little junior league golf shirt on, who's awesome, who's helping with the class, who's going to give this kid a little inspiration. Anybody else do it Thank differently? You. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, personalization, right? So it's kind of like the amateur who asks, where do you put the ball in your stance for a five iron? Right, it's a stupid 
asking question because it depends, right? So it depends, right? It's, you can't really make a rule for what you do with the five-year-old who's Albert Einstein with the 13-year-olds, right? So it's part of the thing that comes with experience and be able to mold and maneuver. And I think it's like the greatest pleasure maybe in what we do as teaching professionals. We're craftsmen. And you can't wait to get there in the morning to do that sort of personalization. One offer. That's great. I, 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 like I'm, I'm enjoying this right now, but unfortunately, um, the music's playing on. We got to move on. We got other presenters here today that uh, will be <laughs> will be good as well. But to your point here, uh, our featured speaker is going to talk all about that. So that's, make sure you folks are here. Uh, how many of you here? Uh, this is the one question. Are here because you still need a heap of uh, uh, hours? And thank not, thank yeah, you for being honest. Bad. We appreciate that. <laughs> okay, so I know there's supposed to be a break, but I think we're going to move right into um, a quick presentation. Is that all right? Five minutes? Okay, so five minutes, a little, a little bathroom break. I want to thank all the, uh, please, uh, for our panel here. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Nice job. Thank you so much, thank you guys. You. Thank you. Pleasure. Likewise. Likewise.